Hi guys. Um, I thought to check on him last night and um, found this little clip here and he's provided two links in his um, description box here and I want to share one of them which is um, a true Torah believing rabbi Yaakov sorry not him <laughs> what's his name now um, oh is it called no Sorry, I'm not quite sure as, as to, because that's, Sh well, it might be Shapiro as well. I don't know. Anyway, here's the uh, the link, and I'm going to play you this little clip, because I think it's important that this is be shared, so people gain an understanding of what's truly going on down there. A lot of us already know, but uh, the people who are doing this are actually anti-religion. We will move the American Embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. No, no. I was with him until he said the eternal capital of the Jewish people. President Trump has the right to make whatever foreign policy he wants, and if he feels that Miami Beach is best to recognize as the capital of Israel, that's his business, he can do it. But once he starts talking about the Jewish people, now he's encroaching upon religion, and now that's my domain. There is absolutely no political relationship between the Jewish people and Jerusalem. It's merely a holy city. The Jewish people don't have a capital. We never had a capital. Countries have capitals. States have capitals. That's the definition of a capital. Capital. Dictionary. Now, the most important city or town of a country or region. Now, the Jewish people are not a country or region. The Jewish people are a religious community. We pray towards Jerusalem, but we relate to Jerusalem only as a holy city, not as a political capital city of the Jewish people. And all of those overtures that we make to Jerusalem and the yearning that Jews have for Jerusalem is only as a holy city, not as a capital city, and because it's a holy city, it doesn't matter who has sovereignty over it. Jerusalem is just as holy and just as much Jerusalem, whether it's under the auspices of the Turks, or the Romans, or the British, or whoever. It's important to know that the, the Zionists were the ones that started this business of the capital of the Jewish people, and it's an idea that conflicts directly with the teachings of Judaism. At Mount Sinai in the desert, the Torah says, the Bible says about us, Hayom Hazer Niyesolaam. That's when we became a, a people. The Jewish people aren't a people because of a land. We're not a people because of a language. We're not a people because of a culture. We're a religion. And when we were deputized into the religion, when we accepted the religion given to us by God, that's when we became the Jewish people. We had no land, no territories, we had no capital city. And in fact, our commentators say the reason why God gave the Jews the Torah in the desert before they went into the Holy Land was in order to teach them that land, country, has nothing to do with your Jewishness. Your Jewishness is because you accept the religion. A couple of years ago, the Pope went to visit Netanyahu, and, and Netanyahu was bragging to the Pope, this is where Jesus lived in this land, and he spoke Hebrew here. So the Pope corrected him. The Pope said, no, Aramaic. And he, he Pope was right. And Netanyahu, was, so Netanyahu says, yeah, yeah, but he understood Hebrew. Well, you know, maybe he did, but, but Hebrew was, was never the national language of the Jewish people. It was a holy language, just like... Uh, the land of Israel was a holy land. Oh, by the way, if, if you see the clip and you don't know which of the two people talking is Netanyahu and which is the Pope, the Pope's the one wearing the yarmulke. Even if we were to pretend that the Jewish people have a capital, that would have nothing to do with whether Jerusalem should be the capital of Israel, because Israel's not the Jewish people. Israel has nothing to do with the old Jewish commonwealth. It's a country that was created in 1948, when you hear the Israelis or the Zionists talk about how uh, Jerusalem has a connection with the Jewish people for 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000 years, it's all true, but that doesn't translate to, well, therefore, Jerusalem has to be part of Israel. People think that Israel is some kind of continuation of the, uh, Jewish uh, governments, and, but it's not. It, it's a completely different form of government, completely different values, completely different ideology, and completely different people. These are not religious Jews that are running the country. These are atheists, and yet... 
the Israeli Prime Ministers from Ben Gurion all the way up to Netanyahu use the Bible as an excuse for ownership of the land. Ben Gurion, he says, the mandate is not our Bible, but the Bible is our mandate. This is a man that didn't believe the Bible was given by God. He didn't believe God ever spoke to prophets. He didn't believe it at all. Neither does Benjamin Netanyahu. It says in the Bible, watch the Sabbath to keep it holy. Netanyahu doesn't refrain from work on the Sabbath. It says not to eat non-kosher food in the Bible. Does Netanyahu do that? No. There is nothing holy in the Bible that Netanyahu cares about. The only thing he cares about is his land. Restorationist uh, Protestants, we call them evangelical Christians today, they existed hundreds of years before any Jewish Zionist was ever born. And because the evangelicals, the Restorationists, had great influence in Britain, and Britain had the mandate. The Zionists very, very much adopted the Christian evangelical interpretation of the Bible, and that's what they use today. You'll find that Benjamin Netanyahu sometimes even espouses Christian evangelical interpretations of the Bible over the Jewish ones. A number of years ago, Netanyahu spoke in the Society of the Auschwitz concentration camp, and he mentioned a prophecy in the book of Yeheskel about how the prophet saw dried bones rising from the ground and growing flesh and becoming live again. And Netanyahu says that that prophecy is fulfilled with the state of Israel because the Jews were dried bones and now they grew flesh and they're, they're real people again. This interpretation is not found anywhere in any Jewish source because in Judaism, this is impossible. But for over a century, this has been a Christian evangelical interpretation. The Zionists, when they talk about the Bible, they're not talking about the Judaic version of Judaism and Jewishness. They're talking really about the Christian evangelical version. Netanyahu has no right to claim that his state is mine. I was born in America. My father was born in Poland. My mother's family is from England. We have nothing to do with Israel. We're Jews. We are observant Jews, we are religious Jews. I wear a yarmulke, Netanyahu doesn't. I keep the Shabbos, Netanyahu doesn't. And Israel is not my nation state in the slightest. This is a, a unilateral claim of the Israelis, of the Zionists, and it's an assault on my religion. So too, the claim that Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish people because it transforms the Jewish people from a religious identity to a national identity, to a political identity. And it's an assault on my religion when Netanyahu says that because Jerusalem is so connected to the Jewish people, therefore it must be part of the state of Israel. Jerusalem's holiness, Jerusalem's value to the Jewish people has nothing to do with who owns it, and it certainly has no reason to be part of the state of Israel. What comes to mind in all of this is this um, purported letter, which I scroll this past you. You can stop and pause and read for yourself. What's the motto for the United States? Now, I don't profess to know whether or not this is true or not. I leave that to everybody else for them to decide. But at this time, I offer another perspective, which gladly the advancement of medicine has given us an insight into. We really need to share this. <clears throat> the people of the book need to come together and not fight with one another. Because the truth is hidden in that book. I spoke in the beginning about how my father was a big, burly American football player and he was a minister and he spent his entire career explaining to people about the wonders of heaven and God and he never talked about the fire and brimstone. He wasn't that kind of preacher. He never preached hell. He always chose to focus on your potential and what he expected you to move towards as opposed to what was going to happen if you screwed up. And so people really always enjoyed listening to him. But as my father went from dementia and transitioned into Alzheimer's, the biggest thing he was challenged with was this horrid fear of death. And I thought, how curious. 
This guy spent his entire life standing in pulpits, working on the football pitch, working with people to try and alleviate their fear of death by preaching what he felt was the one-way ticket to salvation, which, by the way, guys, there's no such thing as one way because I'm going to get so many people will go, she never said anything about Jesus. Well, you know what? I was raised with Jesus, but Jesus, like everything else, is a consciousness. It's a state of being. It's an evolution. So is the Buddha energy. So is there all sorts of, in the history of this realm, there have been many Messiah figures who have come through here to bring people into a state of evolution and consciousness. All the stories in the Bible are allegories. They are describing events and people as states of consciousness, as allegories to show us what happens if you follow certain states of consciousness. I believe it resides within all of us. And so here's why this story is important. My father, the Christian minister, who has believed in this concept of heaven and hell and taught based on the spiritual, you know, the scriptures that support this. He's in his room at the nursing home and he'd had a particularly tough day and he was shuffling around and he had sundowner syndrome, which means this very gentle, giant and peace loving man would get violent and he would have these waves of horrible emotion he couldn't express. He was a beautiful orator. He was such a fabulous public speaker and he'd lost his ability to speak. So all he could do was babble. And so there was this one day that he'd had a really, really tough time. And my mother and I were in the nursing home. We were watching him and he was shuffling back and forth. It had been months since he had said a coherent word. And he lays down in the bed. He starts reaching up. He's reaching for the ceiling. And she's looking at me like, is he getting ready to die? What's going on? One of the interesting things that I can see is what the energy field around an individual looks like. It's just an ability that I've had always. I can see the energetic field around other human beings. Everything has a field. And when someone is getting ready to pass out of the physical form, it looks like fireworks. It's not like you think like a dimmer switch and the lights are going down. It's quite the opposite. Everything's like exploding around them as the energy is gearing up to exit the body. It's gorgeous to look at. And I'm looking at my dad and I'm like, no, mom, it's, it's, there's no fireworks. Nothing's happening around him. So he's in the bed and he's smiling, he's beaming and he's reaching up. And he says, as clear as I'm talking to you right now, I can see it. I can see it. And my mom's looking at me, her eyes are like saucers. And I'm like, hey, dad, you know, because we haven't had a coherent word out of him in months. And he said, hey, sugar. And I said, what's going on? And he said, I can see it. The land beyond the river. I ended up naming a book that because I just thought that was just so phenomenal. He was like, it's so beautiful here. And then he goes, mama, I can see mama. She looks so young. And so he's relaying this experience of seeing his own mother. And he is just marveling in her beauty and her, and her youthfulness. And then he stops and the man looks like a deer in headlights. And he goes, oh my gosh, daddy's here. My father's greatest fear was that his father, who by my dad's very strict Christian standards, did not cut the mustard. My father had worried his entire life about the soul of his own father. He thought he took the downward escalator rather than the up. So the experiences that he had had in his life that my father did not deem honorable or being a good father or being a good person even, my father had convinced himself that his dad didn't make it. So now all of a sudden in this beautiful space, he's looking at not only his mother but at his father. And he's laughing and tears are just pouring down his face. He looks over at my mom and he's reaching out to her and he goes, Helen, I've had it wrong all along. Everybody's welcome here. You can't mess this thing up. It's called terminal lucidity. 
guys, we really need to speak to um, religious people. It's uh, it's in our own best interest and in theirs, if we ever want to see peace on earth. And you want to talk about a mic drop, drop moment in my life? She who's been dead and come back, it was right there, witnessing this man who thought and fell for and lived through the illusion of the separation created by a heaven and a hell that the good people get to go and the bad people don't and like who gets to determine where that cutoff line is. It all just fell away. And in that moment, my father was free. And he got to see that everything that he had known and everything that he had loved and everything that he had hoped for, it was there in the land beyond the river. And it was available to each and every one of us. And he got to see that everything that he had known and everything that he had loved and everything that he had hoped for, it was there in the land beyond the river. And it was available to each and every one of us. You are here to provide and be provided for experientially. You can't mess this thing up. 